Hello and welcome to this edition of The It Factor. I'm Miles O'Brien. Today we'll hear about how a 50-person nonprofit is using SAP technology to save lives. With me now to explain how they do it are Thomas Teig, who is the CEO of Direct Relief International, and Steve Lucas, Executive Vice President, Business Analytics for SAP. Good to have you both with us, gentlemen. I'll tell you yeah. what, before we get started, let's roll. We have a nice uh, little piece of tape which explains what DRI is all about. Then we'll get into our conversation. Let's roll it. One of the exciting things about the SAP software is that we can track a bottle of pills from right here in the warehouse through distribution right into the hands of a doctor at one of our partner facilities in Haiti. We've had about 10,000 SKUs or stock keeping units that we manage. These are prescription medications, needles of different gauges, sutures of different gauges. It's important to be precise when you're dealing with prescription medications. You know, the system that SAP has built in makes that possible, which was not possible before. When a clinic orders supplies, the SAP software makes the picking, packing, and shipping out efficient. But what keeps the donations coming in is transparency. Anyone can access Direct Relief's website to see interactive maps that detail delivery of aid. It's very important for us to be able to demonstrate, here's what we did with your money, here's how it helped, and here's literally where it went. Thomas, tell us a little bit more about uh, Direct Relief. It's an organization that's been around since the late 1940s, was born out of, out of World War II and concerns about people in Europe. This week you were busy helping people struck by tornadoes in the southeast. It's, uh, you're there to provide relief wherever it is needed. Huh? Right. One of the big challenges in uh, emergencies is you need information before you can act. And the challenge is that there's an urgent need to act fast and incomplete information in the emergencies, which often leads to waste and then frustration when they do the after action reviews. And we've been doing it for so long, we realized that we need a system to uh, make as much sense out of the chaos as possible. SAP, uh, as the film uh, said, can allow us, even in emergencies, to help organize information and hone in on it. Just um, caring a lot and just sending stuff doesn't help a person. So I think for us, it's um, really trying to serve the non-commercial market, if you will. And there's a lot of people out there, about two billion people who, um, who need help. Well, let's talk about how this has changed the business, so to speak. You were, you were at the Peace Corps, and you were telling me just before we went on that it wasn't too long ago that you were putting push pins in a map trying to keep track of things. Right. Uh, this, this really does represent a huge shift in how you do business. Right, and I think the, the challenge, I think the advancing technology and the expectations when you're dealing with prescription medications, which are heavily regulated in each of the 50 states and each of the 70 countries we work in, uh, it has to be very clear and very precise and fast uh, if there's an emergency. So in the absence of good information that is uh, that donors can trust, uh, you won't get the support. You, it, it makes no sense just to amass resources and fling them out there. So as uh, we've been trying to do is really bring commercial grade tools to non-commercial areas. There's, there may not be a strong business reason to engage in some of these markets. Uh, but there's a very compelling human reason. So we just want to use the best tools available to identify the need and lean in and optimize what we do. To so you, you need speed and you need transparency. Those are right. two key things. And the transparency, transparency is very important in a lot of businesses, but in this in particular, when you're asking people to write a check right. to make a donation, they want to know it's going for the good and not for some you know, limousine for a, an executive or Absolutely. something, right? Well, and the other, yeah, of course, <laughs> yeah, no, no such limos. Um, yeah. But I think we also work with about 100 uh, healthcare companies that make product donations, right? That, uh, and their big concern is that they don't cannibalize their sales. We tell them there are people that are never going to show up on your sales forecast because they don't have any money. There's no Businesses don't go looking for people who can't buy their goods or services. So consequently, it's very difficult to serve them efficiently if you don't know about them, right? So uh, in telling these healthcare companies, you can help these people with products that you're making, your marginal cost is, is very low uh, to nothing, but we have to ensure integrity of the distribution. It really has to make sure that it's getting to a place that otherwise wouldn't, so it won't constitute a lost sale. The tools of SAP are, are really designed to do that. We use it to do our version of market research. Where is the need? Where specifically is the point of access? What is the distribution channel? And for us to be able to tell the, health, the donor healthcare companies that this year will give us over $400 million on a wholesale basis of products exactly where their products are going 
it's very powerful and it assuages the concerns that would normally exist. Yeah, you, you often hear, especially in other countries, about these supplies ending up, um, you know, it ends up in a black market or a gray market, or doesn't, right. it certainly doesn't get to the people who are in need. Does the SAP software give you the capability to make sure it does, in fact, end up where it's supposed to go? Right. It, um, absolutely. It's, we run it just like a business. I mean, at, at the purpose level, nonprofits are a little bit different than a commercial enterprise. But at the functional level, they're exactly the same. We take an order from a person that we've approved and we've confirmed don't, they don't have the ability to pay. But in fulfilling the order, it has to be precise. We have to optimize the resources to get it to them. And we have to ensure there's integrity of how it's used. And so it doesn't creep back in. And that would hurt the donor companies that are trying to do something inherently good that they're well situated to do. We want to encourage more of that. So you really can't do that without making the case in, in a way that a business executive would understand. Um, and SAP tools have really helped us do that. Well, Steve, tell us a little bit more about that. What, are, what is the difference when, when SAP looks at, at, at the problems and potential solutions for a, a, a 501c3 like mm -hmm. DRI as opposed to a typical you know, Fortune 500 company that you might normally serve? Well, th th there are differences, but there's, there's a few things in common. I mean, one thing that we see with, with every business, whether it's a not-for-profit or, or a, a business for-profit, is getting resources where the need is. Now, in this case, it's a much more noble and much more uh, important need. In this case, it's humanitarian. But if you think about it, SAP's honed its skill at getting resources where the needs are for, for almost 40 years. That's what we're good at as a, as a technology and a software company. Now, it works well in a humanitarian situation because if you think about it, if we don't, with precision, get resources where the need is, you could impact lives. This isn't, this isn't just a disruption in your supply chain that, that impacts can I or can I ship a box. This is something that is dramatic, and I think for, for uh, Thomas and, and his organization, it really comes down to, it makes it, I think, all the more serious for us. But, but at the end of the day, while there, there are differences, uh, the, the common elements, resources where the need are, uh, where the need is, that's number one. And number two is doing it in a timely fashion. I mean, it, it's, it's great if we can do that, but if we don't do it quickly, if, if you spend you know, six months preparing for a disaster that needs response now, it, it's just not going to do any good. So you know, we, we tend to see a lot of commonality that we think really, really helps in this situation. So once again, this issue of speed, real time, in-memory capability, all these things come to bear in, the, in these situations. Well, you know, absolutely. I mean, SAP, again, it, it's about the, the last 40 years. What we've learned is that speed, even in today's day and age, when we, we're amazed by the speed at which we get information, we can go faster. There's so much latency that exists in, in businesses and supply chains and organizations today that we, we just see opportunity to continue to pull that out and just make, make things go ever, ever faster till we get to that true real-time experience. What's, what's the world going to be like then? I think you're talking about the ability to, to walk into a store, walk into you know, kind of any kind of consumption situation, and be able to instantly be presented with the goods and services that you need. Now, in a humanitarian situation, we always want to be able to, to marry up the people that are willing to, to provide or donate supplies with the people that, that need it most. So we think that when a disaster happens, when an emergency needs responding to, that it, it's, not, it's not weeks, it's not days, it's minutes, it's seconds, and that's what we want to be able to do and, and to help Thomas's organization as well. Thomas, have you been able to quantify how much this improves your response? It's probably a hard thing to get a hold of. Well, I think certainly for, with respect to the integrity of the distribution and the precision of the ordering and the fulfillment of uh, precise requests, it, it's demonstrable. I mean, SAP is very good at that, organizing uh, just masses of information um, and being able to glean insights from it and tell you what to, I mean, that there's a big problem in Haiti um, doesn't tell you what to do about it. You, ultimately, the information flow drives the workflow. And the, the challenge with uh, areas of poverty is that we know they're there, but we know very little about them because they're not vibrant consumers right now. So if you're ordering stuff online, you can be profiled nine ways from Sunday. We know what your preferences are, what your tastes are. But if you're not buying, you're kind of off the grid. And the big dilemma, and I think the challenge for us is uh, here at Sapphire now, you see how well we can allocate resources and optimize them. Um, and to bring those same tools to bear on people who really are not in a position to buy things is a, and we're good at that as a species, and for the two billion people who really aren't um, efficiencies, they're not realizing the benefits of efficiencies uh, for health services or even product distribution. So it's this dilemma of in rich areas we're getting more efficient, in poor areas we're not, so the gap is actually increasing, and I think there are ways that you can um, reduce that by bringing some of these 
tools that were developed for commercial purposes into um, places where it's not viable commercially yet, but they need it more than even a viable, um, vibrant commercial market because there are fewer resources. So you've got to get more efficient to do more with less, at least for the short term. Well, that you, Steve, you bring up an interesting point, Thomas, Steve, this notion of a, you know, a technology gap or whatever. Uh, I wonder how long that will last. Uh, it seems to me that as, as mobile devices get cheaper and more powerful and they get in more hands, maybe that's a way of changing that. What are your thoughts? Well, I think you're seeing some pretty amazing things happen right now. First of all, you know, there are going to be, I think it's, I saw the number somewhere in the, the 800 million mobile unit range that's going to be purchased this year. So there are people buying mobile devices, but when you say the, the gap, what we're seeing is that there's a, there's a difference between an emerging economy that's still using basic phones with simple SMS text messaging and, a, and an established economy like the U.S. economy where we have smartphones. But nonetheless, everyone wants to do commerce on those phones, whether it's check your balance, order from your supplier, even in villages in India, they want to do that. So for us, what it comes down to is one of our corporate objectives is to make sure that anyone that has access to the most basic of technology, and we're talking very basic, uh, that we, we incorporate them into the global business supply chain. That's what we want to do. And so SAP's objective of getting to a, a billion users by 2015 is really about not just the established economies, but emerging economies as well, and we want to incorporate all of them. We think that raises the standard of living for everyone if they're all part of that global business network. Well, the gap is good for nobody, is it, right? So. It, does the infrastructure exist in, in the emerging economies of third world to do this? That's a good question. I think that, that you're starting to see a lot of infrastructure, like wireless infrastructure, appear. So certainly we will be dependent, especially in emerging economies, heavily on wireless infrastructure. If we don't have that, you really don't have anything because it's very, very expensive, the outlay for, for cable, fiber. So certainly wireless providers in those economies uh, will be incredibly important. Obviously, political instability or stability has, a, has a, a factor in that as well. But I think that the infrastructure and the opportunity exists. SAP has a lot of, uh, a lot of work that we do with many organizations really helping companies uh, make investments in those emerging economies and outlaying the infrastructure, and then we can follow with the business applications. Thomas, tell me how this affects your ability to um ask for money, which is, after all, what you need to do, we, uh, fundraising. Is it, right. Does it make it easier to, and has your fundraising increased as a result of this, you think? Well, I think it was Aristotle that said money's only good to get something else with, right? You know, <laughs> I mean, money translates into goods or services, so we have a long tradition of sometimes looking at companies and saying, we'd love to have your money, but sometimes we'd like to have what made you your money, and when SAP's staff helps us think through issues, that's what made them a successful company. So much of that is not available to nonprofit organizations like ours. FedEx is a big corporate partner of ours. Um, for us to raise money and then go look for someone like FedEx to do logistics support, we've gone to FedEx and sort of said, can you help us do this? So I think the capacity that exists within industry is enormous. It's just rarely applied to things. Um, if we can get the attention of companies, and we've, um, SAP has been terrific for us, they understood it, they're busy, they have a lot of pressure, but when we presented them with our challenges, they, they got it. They said, okay, where's the market? What information you need? How do you manage it? How do you optimize it? What are your costs? How do you define who your customer? And they had systems to do that, you know, that were done commercially uh, overwhelmingly, but they're equally applicable. The functions are the same, it's just the purpose is different. So we think it, it helps get more participation. We would love to have, um, those things that we raise money to get, if we can find out who's doing those things and get the direct uh, support, you need less money. So our goal is to help more people, not, not to amass more money. And I think we've been able to increase the flow of material resources. We've doubled in the past year, for example. It'll be a, a close to a half a billion dollar organization. And Direct Relief, because we were able to show the integrity of our systems, became the only, the first and only nonprofit organization in the U.S. to become licensed in each of the uh, 50 United States to provide prescription medications. We do it for people who can't pay for them, but it's a commercial grade solution to something that's really not a viable commercial. It's not gonna attract the kind of capital investment required to set up a, a major distribution effort for these uh, clinics where a lot of people go with no money. Well, it occurs to me if you're asking FedEx or these large companies to partner with you, payment in kind essentially, right. The more you act like they do, and the more you run your business like they do, the, the more easy it is right. for them to get comfortable with that notion, right? Absolutely. I think just the fact when, uh, when direct, we made the uh, step to implement SAP, that itself 
was a very strong signal to you know, 19 of the 20 largest healthcare companies in the United States run SAP for a reason. So I think that we can talk to them on their own terms, um, that this is what we need and how we need it and why and how we're going to handle it is very powerful. And um, I mean, business works very efficiently. Um, we need to bring those same efficiencies into places that it's not yet viable for the kind of investment in tools um, that are required to, to bring efficiencies. Now, SAP talks an awful lot, Steve, about partnerships. Uh, how important are these kinds of partnerships for the, for the company? Well, I think that they, they have a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of kind of contribution, I think, to offer SAP in a number of levels. First and foremost is, if you think about what direct relief does, SAP tends to focus, you know, first and foremost on, you know, our business and the for-profit customers. But w when you work with organizations like Direct Relief, you realize that not every organization you know, operates like a for-profit organization, number one, so that's, that's the first thing. And second, it really helps us understand that there is a broader way to consume and gather resources. So if you think about the creativity of Direct Relief in terms of how they get their resources, first and foremost, they, they talk about transparency. They have to create trust with their suppliers, which is we the people. And creating that trust, that's something that SAP looks at and, and kind of says, well, how can we incorporate transparency and trust into our supply chain model with businesses? And it, it really is, I think, a, an incredible level of input that we get from organizations like Direct Relief. But I think also, it's, you know, it, Direct Relief has done some really amazing supply chain optimizations downstream as well in terms of getting resources quickly to where the disaster or where the relief is needed. And that's something as well we can learn from and incorporate into our business model. So you're, you're learning from them. Absolutely, absolutely. I every you day. had all the answers. Well, you know, we have, a, we have a pretty good book on the answers, but I absolutely love what Direct Relief is doing. Well, let me ask you this, Thomas. As you look ahead, what are the things, uh, admittedly, you've got, you have tremendous knowledge, transparency, understanding compared to the push pins. Right. But as you look ahead, what are the things you don't know that you wish you did? Well, I think, you know, the big question is, um, I mean, nonprofits exist because <clears throat> traditionally businesses do what businesses do naturally, right? They, they seek profitability in markets that are viable. I, even if there's a, uh, a front-end capital investment that's high, if you know that profitability exists on the other end, you'll make it. Um, so if they look at a place and the, they don't see the case, they're not going to make the investment, which is why you used to have governments to do these places that are going to you know, they're, they're worth doing, but there's not a strong business case for doing it. Increasingly, as governments contract and businesses get better at focusing on the areas of profitability, the gap between what businesses are going to do naturally and what governments are willing or able to do is why nonprofits exist. So, you know, it'd be great if there were no need for nonprofits, that, that businesses, I've never met anyone who aspires to be the recipient of uh, charitable donations. That's no, no one's life ambition. People want jobs. They, um, they want to be employed and all this good things that come from that, but that gap is pretty steep. So I hope that uh, the business community, like everyone else, can pick up and, and reach downward into these areas mm -hmm. as they get more efficient. They can see a better case to engage uh, in businesses that are going to bring goods and services to people who need them. Um, the question of what governments are going to do, I think that's an open question in all countries. What is the role of government? What is the role of business? Nonprofits are really filling that gap, and it's a, uh, I hope the field shrinks. So people with disabilities in, in developing countries or underdeveloped countries, it's not a strong business case. It's a very strong case to bring efficiencies to that problem, though. And I think um, with the talent that we know as a species, how to deliver goods and services, gather and analyze information and move fast, I have a lot of confidence that we can provide better services to people um, than we are now if we can slow that lag time down between the adoption of technology by governments and by nonprofit organizations to do their work better, because it's not always, um, you can't rely on more revenue if you're a nonprofit. You are obsessed with the expense side and doing more with it. And the tools that businesses make for the same reasons, you know, they're big tools. So a lot of groups don't make them, and then they get less efficient, people get frustrated. So it's not, it's the opposite of a virtuous circle that I think we can reverse if, um, if more companies engage. So uh, nonprofits would be remiss not to consider this as a model for them. Well, uh, is that a statement or a question? I, I, well, I'm, you know, <laughs> go ahead and, and agree well, or disagree. I mean, I, I, w the way you've employed it, the, the practices you've, you've employed have, have served you well. Uh, do nonprofits who, who overlook these models, the, this uh, desire to understand this transparency, the speed, 
will they will they lose out ultimately? There's, there's nothing to disagree with. I mean, it's in everyone. Efficiency is a, a means to an end, and particularly for nonprofits, um, if, if the rationale for doing it isn't profitability, it has to be the mission of the organization. So you want to be, if you get more efficient, you do more of your mission for at lower cost, which is an inherent public good. So I. Uh, you know, it's for each nonprofit to make its judgment, but certainly our experience uh, working with SAP, and, and not just the tools, it's really the thinking underneath them, and you know, the, the whole discipline of going through the exercise. You know, you pull out and step back and look at what you're trying to accomplish, and then you look at what tools exist that are tested every day in this vibrant commercial market that have won. And you, we just thought, well, let's use that one. It totally works, and it's just not being used for these areas that need the efficiencies more than anyone else. So for us, it was kind of not a rocket science um, distinction, and it's proven to be very helpful. Steve, tell us as we look, you know, we've been talking a lot about the year 2015 and what lies mm. ahead, and, and what, what innovations uh, are being cooked up by a lot of the people in this, this big room here uh, that might come to bear and might help out Thomas and other nonprofits as they, as they try to improve the way they do their business or, or do their charity in this case. Well, you know, I, I think if, if there's one undeniable fact, it is that every day there is an incredible amount of information that just gets created that, that is just compounding and compounding upon itself. Well, the year 2015, I mean, today the Internet has 300 exabytes, that's 20 zeros worth of information. It's an unbelievable number to comprehend or to even think about. And to be able to get all that information, if you think about Twitter feeds and Facebook posts, that's just a, an unbelievable sea of information. But to be able to gather that information, and, and if you think about it, sometimes social information is a great predictor or indicator of what's happening, what, uh, what impending disaster, what impending relief might be needed, or how well you're doing on the ground. So for us, by 2015, to be able to help organizations consume all that information, not just what's in your supply chain or what's in your warehouse, but what are people saying about the disaster response that ha that's happening right now in, in uh, New Orleans, in Japan, wherever it may be, to be able to marry that information with what you know the need is and to compare the results, that's where we're headed in 2015. Sounds like uh, nearly a perfect world. Of course, if there was a perfect world, we wouldn't need your organization. Yeah, would we? a painter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Enjoyed the conversation. Steve Lucas and Thomas Teig and Direct Relief International. They're, they have a great website. Check it out. And uh, I would encourage you to hit that donate button there. Thank you. That was Appreciate a free plug. Thank Thanks to all of you for joining us.